Hi folks, welcome to this talk about containerizing Java applications. I'm Nicola Franco, I've been a former developer, architect, whatever, and right now I work as a developer advocate. Uh, since uh, the trend about containerization started, I have became very interested in Docker and Kubernetes and all the surrounding technologies. I work for a company called Hazelcast, and Hazelcast has two products. The main one is an in-memory data grid, and you can think about an in-memory data grid as distributed data, data structures. Uh, so you can uh, shard your data and replicate your data over different nodes uh, over the network. The second one is Hazelcast Jet, and it's an in-memory stream processing engine, so it leverages uh, the distributed nature of Hazelcast IMDG to do this stuff. But today, I won't talk about Hazelcast, I will just use it, and I will talk about how we can containerize our Java app. So let's start with a non-Java app, with a Python application. And how do you containerize a Python application? Well, it's quite straightforward, actually. You uh, inherit from Python image, you add your file that contains the dependencies, you install them, you add the script itself, and then you run the scripts and, and it's done. Likewise, for uh, a Node.js application, you inherit from your Node's base image, you uh, copy the file that contains the dependencies, you install the dependencies and you run again the script. And all what those uh, scripting languages have in common is that, well, there is no intermediate bytecode, there is no compile phase. So the main gist is to inherit from the right image, to inherit the dependencies and, and to run the script. Uh, it's it's we see where what you see is what you run. Whereas in Java, it's slightly more complicated because we have several layers. Um, well, the first one is actually the jar that might contain all the jar, depending on how you want to run it. Um, and here I'm using Hazelcast as a dependency, but again, it's not uh, like warranted. Uh, then you have your JVM and then you have your Docker. And in my sample app, I have a REST endpoint. I want to expose a REST endpoint to the outside world so I can put and get data in Hazelcast. So how do we do it? Well, the easy way is we create the jar outside of Docker. So we just MVN a clean package and then we have a Docker file that wraps it. Let's do it. So here I have my application. Um, it's a Spring Boot application because in the end, I will show you how you can use it with Spring Boot, but um, it, it has only two dependency, uh, the web for the REST endpoint and Hazel costs. And, and then nothing mind blowing. It's just very straightforward. And the Docker file is just, hey, just copy the jar file and put it in Docker and then run java.jar the Docker jar. So here I will be packaging the application in the end clean package. Then I will build the Docker from with the Docker file and because I'm lazy, I will just do that. I won't do it every time because uh, in the end, in some alternatives, it can take quite some time. Here it's pretty straightforward, but uh, yeah, later options can be quite time consuming. And now I can uh, docker run dash dash rm because I don't want to keep it in the end and p because I want it to be expo to expose the ports to the outside world 
and it's called spring in docker column five. So the application starts. I have I have Hazel cost running in the background and now I can curl to check and I will put some data first. X post HTTP local host 8080 let's say world. Uh, it's put because I don't know my own application. Now it works. And then I can curl HTTP to check that the data is still there. 8080. And yes, it's here. I can put another stuff and say hello, Nicola. And yes, so I, I, I have my data. So that's the, the straightforward things to do. And it works. But the issue here is that we actually need to build first jar outside of Docker, and then we use Docker to package the jar, which is not super straightforward. So the next step is to um, run the entire build inside of Docker. So here I have my updated Docker file and to run the build inside of Docker, we actually need to have a compiler. So we inherit from uh, a GDK and not a simple GRE. And we do our like black magic. We copy uh, the MVN folder because we are supposed to be independent. And we run the package, we skip the test because of course there are no tests, but anyway, and, and it works pretty well. And now if we do the same, so I will get back to the terminal. I will stop this one. I will uh, run 1.0 because I, I already uh, like created it before. And now I can check that it still works. So it's the data, the data is still there. Everything works as expected. And yes, it works, but there are several downsides. And um, the biggest downside is we embed a GDK in the final image. Um, it, it has two like big issues. The first is an increased size and uh, we want our Docker image to be as small as possible, when possible. And the, the, the biggest issue is actually the fact that it can compile Java code. So you will actually deliver in production an image that can compile code. And it's, it's a huge security issue. You, you never want to do that. The second problem is uh, about version handling. Uh, as you noticed, it, I need myself and to set the version in when I, I build the Docker image. So I need to remember that uh, this version of the POM is the same as the version of the Docker build. I need to keep them both in sync at the same time. And, and finally, there is no layering. So what do I mean by that? You know that uh, Docker images are layered. So you inherit from a base image and you add some more stuff which creates another image. This image itself can be a parent image and so on and so forth. And uh, the idea is that you can keep uh, the, the, the previous images if they, they were not changed, if they were not touched. Um, Docker doesn't need to, to rebuild them anymore. And now we have this jar and this jar, as soon as you change uh, a library as soon as you change a class file, as soon as you change any, anything, uh, you need to rebuild the whole Docker image. So how do, can we see that? Well, there is a nice um, stuff called dive. So what we will do is we will dive into the image. So I will stop it here and I will dive into spring in Docker 1.0. It takes a bit of time, of course. Uh, 
and here this is how it looks so here I inherit from this base image you can see there was some installation going on and here I was not the one to copy several things uh, here this is what I did this is what I added to my image this is this MVN package uh, where I skipped the tests all the rest is in the returns from the previous image images sorry um, and here this is the issue that this mvnw package adds the whole stuff on the other side and as soon as i change anything well it will rebuild the whole image including get fetching the dependencies so because as, as I mentioned, you, you need to redo everything and parts of the build is to fetch the dependencies. And it, it, it's not great uh, fetching the dependencies as you, you know that uh, Maven, but every build tool that uh, relies on all the jars, they don't load the whole internet. And through relative dependency here, you, you can see that there are a lot, huh? there are a lot here. So every transitive dependency is here and, and we don't want that. So how can we do better? One way to do better is actually um, to do multi-stage builds. And multi-stage builds allows you to, inside the same Docker file, to change the base image. So you can copy a file from a previous stage into your current stage. This is pretty widespread. It's really, really a great uh, thing to, to use. But if you are using scaffold, and scaffold is the tool that lets you like configure your uh, Docker to automatically uh, publish to Kubernetes, either locally or like remote, probably locally. So uh, the problem of multi-stage builds is they are not compatible with scaffold, so, so be careful about that. Otherwise, this is how it looks like. Uh, I will need to quit that. Please let me quit, yes. And I will just use the multi-layer here. So now I have two different layers. I have, sorry, I have two different stages. Sorry about the semantics. The first stage is about building and I'm using a GDK. And once I get the jar, I use another stage where I use a single GRE and I copy the jar from the previous one into this image so this id here and it's 1.1 1 .1, and if we dive into it as you can see here i have like many many less layers and more importantly here i have one single jar I don't have the dependencies issue that I had before, which is a bit better. Still, I have this jar layer and the problem of this jar layer, again, if I change a class file, which will happen all the time, it, I, I will need to rebuild everything. I, I don't need to fetch the dependencies, but I, I need to, to, to rebuild the jar. So the next ID is to start thinking about the jar as a distribution unit, but actually your Docker image is also a distribution unit. And they are pretty redundant. Without Docker, jar is the best distribution unit you can get. But with Docker images, they, they are useless. 
because running a jar inside Docker image, why don't we just run the jar exploded? And that's um, the, the train of thought of the people behind the Jeep plugin, which is a standard Maven plugin. And with Jeep, you just um, like configure uh, your, your Maven prompt to use Jeep. And it also works with Gradle. Um, and, and it can either push to a remote uh, Docker repository or to the local Docker daemon. You can have a lot of configuration options, including choosing the parent image, and it runs the exploded jaw. And there are a lot of benefits. Well, the first one is there is no Docker file because uh, probably all your uh, Java Docker files will look the same. So it's no use repeating them over and over. Uh, the second benefit is you have an automatic, automated version handling from the POM. So if your POM is version X, then Jib knows that it will create version X of the Docker image. And then there are different layers. So there are uh, dependencies and resources and compile code, meaning that the compile code is the stuff that changes the most. And there is no issue. Well, there is not, it's not uh, useful to every time get the dependency again or copy the resources again, if only your, your, your code changes. So this layered uh, a way of doing things uh, is actually the best because if you change the compile code, the code, you compile the code, you only change the utmost layer. Yeah? The, the, depending on how you look at things, the one which is at the bottom or at the top, depending on whether your parent is at the top or at the bottom. So that, that's pretty smart. And actually, in, in the latest, uh, in the latest uh, version, you have four layers. One is about snapshot dependencies, because snapshot dependencies are supposed to change more often than uh, simple dependencies. And so it, it handles that for you. Hmm? So let's do that. And let's see that here in this Here, I've removed the Docker file entirely. There is no Docker file anymore, but I've added the Jeep Maven plugin. And here I'm telling it that it will create the image. And as you can see, it sync the uh, image version with the project version. And the layers look actually very nice. So I need to remember it's version 2.0. I will dive into it. And here you can see that uh, here you've got yeah the, the parent stuff. And here you've got the Jib Maven plugin. The first one was, was, is about the libraries. The second one is about the snapshot libraries. Again, because they change more often. The third one is about the resources. So I like the files. And the final one is about the compile code. So if I need, just need to change the compile code, all the previous layers will be kept and the building of the image will be much, much faster. Also, with Jib, you can configure and, for example, to change the parent image. So here I will be using an Alpine GRE to keep the size of my final image smaller. And if I do a Docker images grab Spring in Docker. We can see here that I have version 2.0 and 2.1. And the 2.1 uses uh, the Alpine uh, parent image. So you can see I shipped off a few megabytes 
which can be a good thing if you've got a uh, like small image, you want to keep them very small. The next option, if you've got a Spring Boot um, application, is you skip the JIP plugin entirely and you use the Spring Boot uh, mechanism. And Spring Boot is also able to create uh, a, Docker a Docker image that is nicely layered. Um, by default, to have like the same ones as in JIP, the dependencies, the resource, the snapshot dependencies, and the compiled code, different order though, but you can customize them. So if you know that some parts of your applications are going to change much more often than others, you can have uh, a dedicated file, an index file that tells you, hey, this, like this package or this stuff, you will put it into this layer and this other into this layer. In order to do that, however, we need to get back to a Docker file. So here is how you do it with the spring. And I have a Docker file again, and it's like a multi-stage uh, build. You can see here you have three stages. The first one creates the package, creates the jar. Then you have a second one that actually explodes the jar. And the third one will actually run uh, the application through um, like a specific uh, Spring Boot mechanism. This is a lot of work, um, but instead of doing that by ourselves, it would be much, much better to let somebody else do it. And that's the idea behind the build packs. Build packs are uh, backed by the Cloud Native uh, Foundation and um, it, it's a tool that's able to understand how to build your project. So if you remember, uh, if you have been doing cloud stuff since some years, you might know about Heroku. And when you were using Heroku, you would just like, like push, you, you would git push your sources to Heroku. And then Heroku on their own servers would try to sniff what kind of project it was and build it accordingly. So it would say, mm, oh, I see a, a pump file. So it's probably a Maven project. So I will build it with Maven. And, and right now, um, th this like way to do stuff was uh, finally uh, seemed to be worthwhile and Iroku was joined by a VMware Pivotal Tensu. I don't remember what their name is right now, Why? by, by Spring. Now they provide, they, 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 they both provide these like standards of build packs. Um, you, you've got a lot of configuration options, um, but you can pretty much do what you want with some limitation, of course. So the idea is that you've got no Docker file, it's scaffold friendly. And because I'm using the Spring Boot project, it knows it's a Spring Boot project. So it can uh, use the previous four layers or if you customized it, all the layers. However, there are some downsides as well. Again, we get back to the fact that there is no sync between the POM and the Docker image. There is, it's not that there is no choice of the parent image, it's a very limited choice. And if you want to change the parent image, you need uh, to put an image that is uh, compatible. And I, I try to dive into it. it, it it's just not some labels. It seems to be a pretty, pretty complex and dedicated process. 
Uh, I've noticed it, it takes a long time, uh, even without changes. So perhaps I, I mismanage it, but it, for me, it's, it's very long. Uh, it, it's especially very long because um, the build images, they are downloaded every time. So uh, every time it downloads the GDK again. So um, it, you can do it by running. Uh, you, first, you need to install uh, the build pack. Then you run pack, you set the build the parent build image, the builder, sorry, and it will infer the build image. But why do that? Um, with the latest version of Spring Boots, we can do the same inside of Maven or Gradle, and it will use it under the cover. So how do we do it? It's quite easy. We just run Sorry, not here, here. We just run Spring uh, MVM, always MVM, Spring Boot, Build Image. Again, the process is very, very long, so I, I won't show it to you. And in the end, this is what we get. We got rid of the build the, of the Docker file again. And here we have the layer configuration enabled. And as you can see, nothing has changed otherwise. So the, the, the plugin itself knows how to create uh, Docker images. That's pretty good. And the really, really nice stuff is that um, there are configuration options and it's very easy to change the configuration option to use GraalVM and to build a GraalVM native image. For example, here, that's the last stuff I want to show you. To create a native image, you just add an environment variable, BP boots native image true, and that's done. And if we check, again about the size of the images so they are here here you have the like spring boot inside a gvm and here you have the spring boot inside like normal native process so if you are interested in cloud stuff if you want to have fast thought of time and low memory consumption, then you, you can just use this kind of images. And it's a wrap. I just want to finish by uh, mentioning the Docker squash. You can try to flatten the layers. And I, in this sample application, uh, I try to flatten the layers from 1.0 and it was less than 1% gain of the size. And from uh, the 5.0, it was again less than 1% gain of the size. Um, so depending on what you value, if you value faster build time or smaller image sizes, you might want to check Docker Squash. Um, might depend on or your use case and probably on your parent images but with the sample my layers were nicely done so docker squash doesn't bring any benefit so as a recap um, when you want um, to uh, dockerize your uh, java application you must think about several things uh, you must think about the sync of the version between the, between the palm and the image. Uh, but you must think about organizing the layers uh, to develop faster, for your builds to be faster. And yeah, probably forget about Squash, though it might have seemed super popular at some point, it's not anymore. So thanks for listening to me. Um, you can read my blog, you can follow me on Twitter, and more importantly, if you want, to try the things that I did here, 
there is everything is about is on GitHub. So thanks a lot and have a good day.